Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 10th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, while some candidates say they support maintaining PFDs, the numbers show they are misleading voters. Second, while some talk a good game, Lynn Gaddis has already shown she is capable of effectively standing up to a binding caucus when the times require. Third, while July ANS production numbers were strong, they need to be put in context. And now, let's join Michael. Today, our weekly top three starts out. We've got three big targets uh, that we're going to talk about. One is John Coghill's numbers, Lynn Gaddis's track record in oil production numbers. Let's start off with the numbers uh, surrounding uh, John Coghill. He recently had a piece in the Fairbanks Daily News Miner where he quoted some stuff, including saying that he thought that uh, uh, the dividend, uh, you know, was great for the people and all that, but that... Uh, he felt that about one third should go to the dividend, meaning cutting the dividends down to a third and the rest of it should basically go to government, uh, which has been, uh, I think, kind of on par with their argument for a while. Brad, you've taken a look at these numbers. Uh, what say you, my friend? Well, this is this is part of the, the series of don't pay attention to their words. Look at their numbers and, and see what they're going to do. Coghill. Uh, did say in the news miner uh, interview, he said, with regard to the per Alaska Permanent Fund Fund's earnings, he feels about one third should go toward a dividend, with the rest paying for services. And I've been running numbers on on what candidates have said and and what that means. Um, and so I did that with John's uh, and looked at at, uh, at at what his uh, the significance or the impact uh, of, of what he was saying. If you if you take John's been against taxes. He's been against all sorts of uh, other new revenues. He's always he's always relied on using uh, the PFD, cutting the PFD to pay for government. If you if you look at next year's budget and you and you take uh, set aside a third of the permanent fund earnings uh, for uh, the PFD, which John says he would do, or John says he supports, you still have a 1.3 billion dollar deficit. That you're facing. Now, remember, next year's deficit is $2.3 billion. Under current law, uh, statutory PFD, next year's deficit is $2.3 billion. We're about 50% uh, in deficit uh, next year using spending at, uh, at what you know, various legislators have said they want to do, which is capping spending at inflation. Spending is around $4.6 billion. Other rev uh, uh, traditional revenues are about $2.3 billion. If you cut the PFD down uh, uh, to, a, to a third, which is what John says, you still have uh, a billion three uh, in deficit. You add up, you add back in some revenues, but you're still a billion three in deficit. So the question is, where's John going to get that billion three? And, and the answer is, John's not going to tax oil companies. He's been very clear on that. John's not going to go to a broad-based tax like sales taxes or, or income taxes, flat, progressive, otherwise. He's been very clear on that. So where's that billion three going to come from? And the answer is, when push comes to shove, it's going to come out of the PFD. He's going to essentially eliminate the PFD in order to pay for government. 
So when you look at the numbers, you realize that this statement by John uh, of I'm, I'm in favor of a one-third PFD or one-third of earnings, using one-third of earnings to PFD, is just it, – it, it, just, oh, I want to I use a word that starts with B, but I shouldn't. Uh, it's just, it's just uh, uh, fiction. He's just making stuff up in order to be able to say that he's that he's in favor of the PFD, uh, and in order to you know claim that he's being a responsible, uh, uh, law-abiding uh, legislator right. uh, that's that's paying attention to the PFD statute, uh, but he's just making stuff up. The numbers, when you do the numbers on what John's saying, and his past positions. Uh, they don't add up, well, and 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 the thing that's going to take it, the thing that's going to take it is is the PFD. This is just like Kathy Geisel did in 2016. I mean, you've played the video, others have played the video over and over and over about Kathy Geisel saying she was for a PFD during the uh, during the campaign. She was against Governor Walker's uh, veto uh, of of taking money from the PFD, and she would stand up with Mike Dunleavy. Uh, when they came back to session and 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 would would vote to overturn that that veto and 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 resurrect the PFD, I mean that's what she said for campaign purposes. And then right. when push came to shove, when she got in the legislature, you know that that all went away. John's doing the same thing. Well, John's look. saying that he's now in favor of a of a third PFD, right? Uh, a a one third PFD, but it's just not it. it the, the numbers just don't add up. Well, let, let, let me say this. Okay, so first of all, you don't you don't have to say it. I'll say it. It's a bunch of bull. Is what it is. It's a bunch of bologna sandwiches. And uh, you know, let me just let me just portray John Coghill down the road. Well, I'm going to pay a one third PFD. Then we get into the session, and he's like, you know, we've looked at these numbers, and these numbers are so hard, and so everybody's just going to have to sacrifice. And so to avoid any kind of taxation, we're just going to have to take the full PFD. I'm sorry, but that's just the reality that we're under now. I mean that's exactly what I mean I can I can predict I can write this I can write the script from here. I can see exactly what he's trying to do. As you said, he knows that he cannot run on taking the PFD in the full and this is as much as he can hedge, but when push comes to shove and they come down the road and they're still 1.3 billion dollars short, he's going to have to say, "Well, you know, it'd be great to pay it, but we can't. It's just we're just going to everybody's going to have to take one for the team." It's exactly right, and and there are other candidates that are doing that uh, in this election cycle. I mean, I I can pick on John all day long, but but there, we've had other candidates come on the Facebook page and say, well, you know, I'm in favor of a full PFD, and I'm gonna, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna support a full PFD. Great. What's your fiscal plan for how you're gonna balance this budget? Well, I'm gonna cut. All right, you're gonna cut 50 percent of the budget in one year. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, you know, cut it five percent a year or ten percent a year, and then you can play those numbers out, and you know, you still got a billion, five hundred billion, a billion and a half, a two billion dollar gap. Uh, I, one candidate said he was going to cut five percent per year. That resulted in something like a six billion dollar additional deficit over the course of the of the time it it it, it brought the budget down. So what are you going to so what are you going to do? I mean, those numbers don't work. What are you going to do? And 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 usually the answer is you know that's where the conversation ends. There's there's never there's never a response to that. What you've got to do with these candidates, John Coghill, chief among them, but what you've got to do with the candidates is is ask them the details of how they're going to pay for two point three billion a two point three billion dollar deficit, um, uh, and and preserve the full PFD. And I you know I've got an answer to that. I'm 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 not shy about explaining how. How I would do that, uh, but the, but but candidates can't. And and when when you have a candidate like John, who's saying one thing, who's saying I want to support a you know I want to keep a a one third earnings uh, 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 PFD, saying that, but who has a track record and you know exactly where he's going to go. He knows exactly where he's going to go. Um, uh, you, you just have you, you you can't take those statements at face value. This is sort of a this is sort of the 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 the, the replay of 2016 when Kathy Geisel said that you knew that wasn't what she was going to do. You heard those words coming out of her mouth, but you knew that wasn't she, what she wasn't going to do when you put pencil to paper and, and ran the numbers. You know John Coghill's not going to do that. I mean, for for people who read that column and said, "Oh, John's in favor of a PFD, a little bit smaller one, but he's still in favor of a PFD." I'm gonna I'm gonna vote for John. You're just you're being you're being misled. I mean, the, the numbers just don't back it up. So when right. you hear a candidate 
uh, give you a solution uh, to, 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 to what the fiscal problem is, uh, run the numbers, uh, and, and look at, at, at where that candidate comes out. Because, because at least in John Coghill's case and in other candidates' cases, it just doesn't add up. The numbers well, just don't add up. Well, and that's the hard question, Brad. I mean, yesterday we had uh, uh, Mike Prox on from One Alaska, um, and I asked the question, okay, so if we don't, you know, if we don't tax, if we don't utilize the tax from the, from the oil taxes, you know, hypothetically, I'll give you that it will maybe damage the, the future of the industry here in the state. It could slow down production, you know, four or five years out. I mean, it could be a, a problem. I said, but what, then how do you fill the gap? What's your, what's the alternative solution for us to fill the gap? And there's just no answers. That's the problem. There really, there, no one out there really, to my satisfaction, has answered the question about how we're going to fill this gap. Well, we'll cut. Well, cutting, again, past performance is indicative of future results. Cutting only has just not worked. Now, unless we change everybody out and change out a bunch of the players and the people who are all saying we're going to cut, get in there, which I would applaud. I want to cut. I hope that it would be the first line of defense. But we've already seen it with Mike Dunleavy and the, uh, you know, and the legislature that we had before. They weren't willing to cut it back. I mean, an $800 million cut, we ended up with a tenth of that when it was all said and done. I mean, it just, it, 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 there is just not the political will with this group to make it happen. And so, and so what do they resort to? They resort to PFD cuts because those are the easiest uh, uh, to make, and and those are the ones that their that their contributors, the, the donor class, are, are 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 fine with because they're not touching uh, the top twenty percent. They are in essence taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. So I'm I'm looking for candidates who are willing to fess up. Rob Myers, who opposes, uh, who's running against John uh, in that race in the in the same Fairbanks Newsmeyer interview. Rob Myers confronted that question. Said, "Look, I'm looking at." He said, "I'm looking at a flat tax." We 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 have to have candidates who are honest and who are willing to step up and say that there are alternatives that are better than taking money out of taxing middle and lower income Alaska families in a way that has the largest. This is ICER 2016 study in a way that has the largest adverse impact uh, on the overall economy. There are other ways to do it. That don't have that don't have that impact on middle and lower income Alaska families, and don't have that impact on the overall uh, Alaska economy. Uh, but you've got you've got to run the numbers. You, you you need to stay in touch with the numbers to understand what these candidates are saying. And John Coghill's statement that he supports a PFD or he supports a one third PFD or that's the right that's the right place land to land is just you use the correct B word baloney. It's just, I mean, it's it is not worth the paper it's written on. It's not worth the 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 air, the brain way, the brain time it takes to read those words uh, in the in the news monitor. It has those statements by John have no value, um, and 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 people who are out there reading these things and saying, well, John, you know, supports it. He doesn't, you know, Mike Prox saying, you know. Don't don't do don't do Prop One. It's a, it's a bad thing. Well, well, Mike. The other thing that's going to happen if you don't do Prop One, given where we've been on history, is we're going to take money out of middle and lower income Alaska families that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Is that is that better? That's not better. That's worse. Right. right. Um, so uh, you, you, uh, these candidates need to need to address the numbers, and if they don't address the numbers. Then, then the people who are voting need to need to look at the numbers before they go in the voting booth. And Brad has already run these numbers. You can take a look at them. I already posted them up during the video broadcast this morning, and I've just posted the link inside the comment section uh, on our Facebook page, so you can go see them there. As always, uh, we've got uh, Harold the Contrarian in the uh, in the chat room, Brad. So I'll read this uh, comment for you, and you can respond. Um, the flat tax and ICER sigh. You cannot put forth numbers with zero basis. I mean, the numbers are, I mean, you've run the numbers. ICER's run the numbers. These are not, you know, static in a vacuum. These are numbers that are based on the economy and things that are going on and market and values and everything else. So, I mean, unless there's some alternative numbers that Harold's going to uh, present, um, I would suggest that uh, this is the best case that we have based on the information that's available. ICER is the best 
uh, analysis we've got in the state. Uh, uh, it was backed up by an ITEP report, Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy, uh, in 2017. No one's produced other numbers uh, than ICER. I've dug into them. I've checked them out. Sean says, I'd love to feed some of the back Michael Duke shows, I guess back episodes, that nail the governor's well-thought-out plan to tackle the deficit. I'd like to get Calvin Moto up to speed. Um, I mean, we've talked about this. We've talked about this for years. I mean, uh, you know, uh, and not to toot my own horn, but even before Brad started coming on the show five, six years ago, uh, I've been talking about this deficit spending for 15 years on this program. Uh, I've talked about the cu- the size and scope of government. I've been pushing this idea of smaller, more li- – that you couldn't spend, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14,000 dollars for every man, woman, and child in the state and continue to have that work out economically. And, I mean, now, of course, I mean, now I'm, I'm right, right? But I, it's the same thing I've been saying the whole time. People are just not paying attention. Um, and I think maybe now they're starting to, but I don't know if it's too little too late. Um, Brad, what, what do you think? Well, the problem, the problem, Michael, is we didn't make – I mean, back in, in 2012 and 2013, when you could see this coming, when ICER – just to you know, mention a, a, an economic analysis group – when ICER was doing the numbers and saying, we, we've got a problem coming, we've got a serious problem coming, if we would have started making cuts back then, if we would have made you know, the 5% cuts that some candidates are talking about now, if we would have started making them then, we could have headed this off. We could have we – you know, extended the period of time that we had uh, that we had the the constitutional budget reserve and the, and the statutory budget reserve, we we could have we could have headed this off, uh, uh, but we didn't, uh, and we and we kept going full bore with spending. We we cut down on the capital budget. We cut down on the seven billion dollar budgets, uh, but uh, but we kept going full bore on the operating budget, and we kept spending ourselves deeper and deeper into the hole. We kept you know draining savings more. And more and more, and now we've still got this. We've still got these this structural problem of high spending. We've got no savings left, and now the revenues have dropped out from underneath us again. Uh, uh, you know, oil has gone from what was what was beginning to be sort of a, a seventy dollar oil era. They're they're down to forty dollars. So we we've just had this. We, we we've had this sort of change in the last couple of years. No savings. Structural uh, operating spending continuing, uh, and revenues dropped out from underneath it. So now we've really got no choice. I mean, now we've got now we're in a situation where we're out over the Grand Canyon on the high wire with no safety net underneath us, no no savings underneath us, and and we've got to do something. Something is going to get taxed. Uh, it's either going to be uh, it's either going to continue to be middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts or it's going to be all Alaskans and non-residents fairly through a flat tax, or it's going to be oil companies, or it's going to be, you know, future Alaskans in terms of taking money out of the, out of draining the ERA, uh, which is the investment uh, uh, pool for, for uh, future permanent fund earnings. Uh, it's somebody's going to get taxed. And, and, you know, we can cut, let's say we cut $500 million. Well, we're still $1.8 billion uh, in deficit. So we had the opportunity back in the early in the early 20 teens, when when you were talking about it, I was talking about it, ICER was talking about it, others were talking about it. We had the opportunity. We didn't do it. We had legislators who just said, you know, we'll get to it next year. We'll get to it next year. We'll get to it next year. You know, we'll, we'll be it. We'll do it on a three-year plan, and then in, in, and and they'll sort of make right. a bluff in, in one year. Yep. No, that's exactly it. We're on to number two of the weekly top three, which is candidates that uh, actually don't just talk the talk but walk the talk. Uh, and Brad comes on with us this morning uh, talking about a uh, candidate in the Valley, uh, 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 Lynn Gaddis. Uh, and he uh, continues with us now. Brad, uh, go ahead. Well, there, there was a mailer that went into the Valley into, in Lynn Gaddis's race uh, in which uh, there was essentially a statement made that, uh, quoting Mike Shower, that, that said that, that Lynn is – is questionable because you know she would support a binding caucus, and certainly a binding caucus is uh, is Mike Shower's big deal, and uh, and is 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 a big deal in in some of those races. I, that that statement really sort of outraged me because of any uh, legislators out there, Lynn Gaddis is one of those who's demonstrated her her willingness and her legislative ability to work against legislative leadership 
when it's uh, when it's uh, uh, not in the interest of of her uh, constituents. Let's go back to 2016 for a second. 2016, GCI had spent zillions of dollars, well, millions of dollars, but it had spent a hell of a lot of money pushing uh, uh, an effort to amend the PFD statute significantly to reduce the PFD, uh, essentially trivialize uh, the PFD, and, and by statute divert uh, most of the money that would otherwise go to the PFD uh, to, uh, to state government. That was GCI's big effort that began after Bill Walker got elected, uh, and 2016 was when it all came to a head. They had uh, uh, hired lobbyists that were down walking the halls uh, of the legislature. They had a governor behind them, and turns out they had legislative leadership behind them. Um, uh, the Senate passed uh, the GCI bill. Uh, it came over to the House, and legislative leadership in the House was uh, was supporting it. There was one place that bill could get stopped, and that was in the House Finance Committee. Um, and and Lynn Gaddis, Tammy Wilson, Lance Pruitt, um, and Dan Sadler uh, were were Republicans on the, uh, in addition to others, were Republicans on the on the House Finance Committee. The leadership pushed uh, the members of the House Finance Committee to let the bill go through. The argument was, well, let's just get it to the floor and let it go to a vote. But leadership wouldn't have been pushing the bill to get it to the floor and let it go to the vote if they didn't know it was going to pass. They didn't realize it was going to pass, hadn't count noses, and knew they had enough to, to count it. That, was, that vote in House Finance was the critical vote uh, that, that has kept the permanent fund statute uh, in place uh, uh, today. To today, House House Finance House uh, leadership. Uh, uh, Mike Chenault as a speaker. Um, uh, uh, the majority leader wa- uh, was behind it. The the two co chairs of Senate Finance were pushing it. Um, uh, uh, Steve um, Steve Thompson uh, Steve Thompson uh, and Mark Newman uh, were pushing it. Uh, the two co chairs of, of House Finance. The leadership of House Finance uh, was, was pushing it. Lynn Gaddis uh, uh, orga- helped organize four Republicans who voted against the bill, the, the members, the, the, the non-leadership members of the, uh, of the House Finance Committee that voted against the bill. Her, Tammy Wilson, Mark Newman, and Dan Sadler. Michael, you'll remember this better than anybody because you're the one that got Dan Sadler to say on the air, uh, uh, in 2016, that he would oppose uh, that bill in committee. He would he would buck uh, leadership and committee. If it hadn't been for that effort, organized largely by Lynn and Tammy, if it hadn't been for that effort in House Finance to buck leadership, uh, to defy leadership, uh, to defy what you know many people say is the binding caucus, to defy. Uh, uh, where leadership wanted to go. If it hadn't been for that effort, the PFD statute would have been amended, uh, and we wouldn't be even talking about the PFD anymore. It would have been it would have been trivialized. Right. So Lynn, Lynn Gaddis has walked the talk. When people talk about you've got to buck leadership when it's the when it's important to your district, when it's the right thing to do, Lynn Gaddis was there and and walked that talk and showed that an effective leadership, uh, an effective legislator can do it. She didn't make floor speeches. She didn't, you know, get sanctioned on the floor. She didn't, uh, you know, do an op-ed. She didn't, you know, whine to the press. She got in there and worked the votes to keep, to to kill that bill uh, in committee. And I think, uh, you know, if people don't remember that, they should. Because right. that, to me, was is the epitome of what you send legislators down there to do. Not to whine, not to, not to do op-eds, not to do stunts on the floor, but to effectively you know, represent their district, organize votes, organize efforts in order, to, in order to affect legislation. And that's what she did in 2016. And I think anybody who says she's part of the problem because she's, she, you know, she supports binding caucus, that's just wrong. Right. Lynn has demonstrated to us what she will do when she's down there and she will she'll step through and do the right thing. Well, and I think the biggest assertion here for me and I haven't spoken to Senator Shower about this yet, but the quote in the mailer says Lynn Gaddis is part of the system that got us here. We needed new ideas and new people if we're to see a real, real change. If Lynn supports a binding caucus, which I've heard she does, 
she will join the likes of Lance Pruitt, who told the Republicans they must have a binding caucus, et cetera, et cetera. If Lynn supports a binding caucus, which I've heard she does, I would think that Senator Schauer would reach out to her before making. So I don't know if this was an endorsed comment by Senator Schauer or not, but it was used in the uh, it was used in the uh, in the flyer that way. Um, it also says Lynn left the governor's office and went to work as a staff of the Democrat-led majority. She went to work in Tammy Wilson's office. We, we've talked on this program about Tammy was in the majority, but she was trying to, you know, she was trying to work the angle of, you know, trying to keep some equitability in there. And I think Tammy, you know, I think most people would still acknowledge that Tammy was one of the most conservative and budget hawkish people in the entire legislature and that's why lynn went to work for her because she needed help doing that so again i you know if you're going to run run on the merits don't run on these you know, lynn voted for sb 91 holy cow most of the legislature voted for sb 91 and most of them were for its repeal when they figured out how bad it was so i mean this is you know i mean shelly hughes voted for sb 91 there's a whole bunch of people that did to me this is in a lot of ways, it's it's smoke and mirrors. It's much ado about nothing. I don't know Chris. I you know we'll have him see if we can get him on the program. But this is uh, you know again. I don't I don't see Shower saying something like that without having vetted it. But um, I don't know. I haven't spoken to him yet. Well, I just I, it, I I really don't care what Mike says about it because it's just wrong. It's just wrong. Lynn Gaddis is one of the very few people. Those four who stood up in 2016 and stopped. The GCI effort, one vote short, they won by one, they, they stopped it by one vote. If any of those four had broken, uh, the vote would have gone the other way. The PFD statute wouldn't be, what, wouldn't, wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about it anymore because it would have been trivialized. One vote. Lynn, Lynn in 2016 stood in there, stood the fire. I mean, I, I recall stories of Shower coming down, or not Shower, uh, Chanel coming down to her office. I recall stories of her roommate at the time, Sharice. Millett, uh, 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 you know, trying, who was the majority leader, trying to talk Lynn into, into breaking. If Lynn had not stood with Tammy and with Pruitt and with Sadler uh, to stop it, Newman the PFD and, would be dead. Yeah, Newman and Sadler, right? No, Newman. No, Newman voted for it. Oh, I'm sorry. It was, okay, yeah. You Pruitt. So, Pruitt. So Newman, I mean, Newman was part of the problem. Newman was one of those people who said, yeah, let's get it out of committee. Let's get it on the floor. I'll vote against it on the floor. They'd already done the head count. For the floor they knew they were going to pass it on the floor right so that sort of stance by newman was just was 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 trying to set it up for the kill all right so lynn gaddis walks the talk you've uh, i think you've uh, pressed a good point here uh we're running out of time here i want to touch on number three which is about the new oil production numbers uh we got about two minutes here if you can synopsize it and we can finish it up in the break sure so there's an article in the in the in the Alaska Journal of Commerce about uh, the July production uh, J- July uh, ANS production. The headline is North Slope production beating prior years uh, after pan- pandemic cuts, and it, it talks about the fact that July production numbers uh, were higher than than any July since 2013. That's certainly true, and it's certainly good news. But we have to put it in context. Uh, uh, during the summer, uh, the North Slope usually has maintenance, um, and and uh, summer production numbers are usually down because of maintenance and because of the warm weather, which which inhibits maximum production. Um, July is typically the month in which they take a part of that maintenance, so July production numbers are usually down. Uh, there was an exception to that uh, last year. Last year, 2019, July production numbers were up. And then August numbers fell because they took the maintenance turnarounds in August. Uh, so saying that July production numbers up are, production numbers are up is good, uh, but it's not it's not uh, a, a recognition that all of a sudden we've broken through on the North Slope and we're going to have high production going forward. I've taken a look at August numbers. August numbers already are down. Um, uh, there's there's some maintenance going on. We have still got Alpine out there to, to go through maintenance. It, you, you have to look at the entire summer, you have to look at the entire year, actually, but you, have to, you can't just take one month in isolation and say, oh, look, these numbers are up. We've broke, we've, we've, we've you know, we have, we have a, a new record uh, uh, since 2013, uh, and, and all of a sudden everything's fine. You can't do it that way. You've got to look at uh, those numbers in context. Do you want to extrapolate on that a little bit more, or do you want to, uh, anything else you want to touch on this morning? No, I, I think the I think the production numbers. I mean, it's important to recognize that that July is up, but 
you know, there's several factors going on here. One is we did it doesn't look like we took any maintenance turnarounds in July. Some of those may have been taken in June when Conoco had uh, had its fields curtailed because it was responding to the the, the drop in prices and uh, had had curtailed fields both in May, frankly, uh, and in June they may have taken some of the turnaround uh, turnaround there, which means that there was no turnaround affecting their fields at least uh, in July. There's also because Conoco had their fields uh, curtailed in June. Uh, there's also the phenomena of flush production. That is, when you have a when you have a well curtailed, pressure will build up in the uh, uh, in the in the well, uh, and when you turn it back on, or when you when you when you uh, bring the well back up to full levels, it will flush. Uh, some of that pre- some of that pressure will will result in additional production above and beyond what you would have had uh, had you not had the well curtailed. So we saw some of that uh, uh, show up in July. Um, so there's 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 a lot of things going on in July uh, that that I think uh, account for uh, for the high production numbers. Other than other than all of a sudden you know we we're we're, we're back up and running uh, on the slope. I will say this. I will say Milne, uh, which is the field that Hillcorp uh, has been op- had been operating before it took over uh, Prudo, uh, that Milne numbers are up, and it looks like Milne uh, Hillcorp's done a good job. Uh, making additional investments and 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 bringing uh, Milne uh, uh, farther along, but but that's you know it went from like 17 to 35, I think. So it's not it's a it's a number, it's a bigger number, but it's not a number that's going to make or break uh, make or break the bank here. Uh, as I say, important to recognize uh, that July numbers are up, uh, but it's but it's not much of an indication of of the long term. There's a lot of things contributing to July. Uh, that makes that number higher. And as I say, uh, I've looked at August, and August is already down again. So um, uh, it, it's it, some tried to make a lot out of it. Some tried to say, well, you know, this proves that you you got, you got to vote no on Proposition 1 uh, because, you know, the oil industry is coming back and we don't want it. Well, it doesn't mean that. Uh, it means that a lot of a lot of factors coalesced around July and made those numbers good. We ought to celebrate good numbers. We ought to take the production. We ought to take the revenue that generated, but we don't need to, you know, uh, extrapolate uh, uh, that fact way beyond uh, uh, what was justified. And what does it look like? Uh, I mean, any of the latest numbers on uh, oil pricing or production? Anything changing here? Before I let you go, uh, in the futures or what's happening? It- yeah, there, there's good and bad. So, so Brent is continuing to sort of gradually creep up. I think Brent. I, I saw one headline this morning when I got up that Brent had had broken 45, um, and that it was on the plus side. The problem, but, but the the bad side is A and S and Brent have diverged again. You'll remember during uh, the the dark days of uh, of April, May, and June when i kept you know, i kept saying that there's a real problem here and that brent or the ans is much lower than brent's typically traded at least at parity if not a little bit of a premium to to brent and and ans had broken away and it was you know multiple dollars uh, uh, below brent it's doing that again uh, uh brent's uh, around 45 uh but ans is around 43 42 um, and so the, the headlines you see about Brent being up is not true of ANS. Uh, uh, ANS is, is diverging again. So good news uh, in terms of, 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 of you know Brent being up, and if ANS can get back to parity, good news for ANS. But uh, but it's not perfect news. All right, Brad Keithley. Alaskans uh, for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, I appreciate you coming on board and sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, While, again, while we don't always agree, it is good, thought-provoking discussion, although I pretty much agree with everything you said today. So uh, it's good stuff. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for raising all our blood pressures a little bit here. (laughs) Michael, uh, 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 thanks for having me, and and, uh, and, and it's good you got Chris coming on next. Yep, that's exactly it. We're going to just, he's going to smooth, he's going to just pat me on the head and tell me everything's going to be okay. He's going to, he's going to cuddle me and tell me everything's going to be okay. So it's going to be good. All right. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate you being part of it. Thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. 
This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.